In this video, I'll discuss the pros and cons of investing in common stock. Then I'll describe the annual returns on the S&P 500 index. And then next, I'll give you several well-known definitions for specific securities. Finally, I'll describe the intrinsic price per share and target price per share and how they relate to the market price per share. Let's get started. There are many benefits to owning common stock. First, as you're aware by now, stocks historically outperform bonds by a significant amount. This is a chart of the annualized returns of the S&P 500. As you can see, during most years since 1930, the S&P 500 return has been fairly high. I mean, on average, I know I've quoted this statistic to you many times, but the average return on the S&P 500 has been about between 8 and 10%, depending on the time period that you're measuring it. But as you can see, in most years, there is a positive return. Next, stocks represent residual ownership of a firm. As I mentioned a few lectures ago, this means that in the case of Chapter 7 bankruptcy or liquidation, where assets are sold off, once the bondholders, employees, and government are paid what they're owed, the shareholders get what's left. Usually, that's pennies on the dollar if there's anything left. Next, most stocks offer voting rights. This point is very important. Besides the total return shareholders receive, voting rights are arguably the second biggest benefit. As a shareholder, you get to vote in the next annual shareholder meeting. Let's take a look at a proxy statement to see what items come up for a vote. So I'm on the Edgar website and I've gone to search. I'll go to search by company and I'll just go with Apple. So Apple Co. Search. And now I'm going to search for the company's DEF 14A, or proxy statement. This is the document that gets sent out to shareholders eh, maybe a month or two before the annual shareholder meeting. So let's take a look at annuals, uh, Apple's last annual DEF 14A. So this document essentially shows everything that will be voted on at the annual shareholders meeting. So this is the date and time when and location where the meeting will take place, so February 26th, which is obviously already passed, 9 a.m. Pacific time in Cupertino, California, and here are the items of business. So they're going to elect seven nominees presented by the board, and these are the people up for re-election, so people like the CEO Tim Cook, uh, former Vice President Al Gore, several other individuals who are longtime board members of Apple. The next thing that the company is going to vote on is whether or not to retain the services of Ernst & Young as their independent public auditor. That's a very common thing to be voted on. Usually, if you get a DEF 14A, uh, the company is certainly going to vote on new directors and then who the independent auditor will be. Next, there probably will be some shareholder proposals put forth in the proxy statement so you can vote on something that shareholders have asked be brought up for the for a vote at the annual annual shareholder meeting these are very common in annual meetings uh, and then finally we have some other things here uh, whether to approve an executive compensation package that that, along with these other two things, is probably the, the third most common item of business that you'll see on the DEF 14A. And then maybe there will be some other business that comes up. Next, in the U.S., stocks are easy to buy and sell via a broker. U.S. stocks on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ are highly liquid. And nowadays, your brokerage fee for small stock purchases and sales is very low. I mean, it's zero for most brokerage firms right now. Finally, the the last big benefit I have for you in this this opening slide is that in the in the US, price and market information are easy to find in the news and financial media. There are literally thousands of sources you can use to find data concerning a stock. Therefore, diligent investors should be able to accurately price new information. Now there are two big drawbacks to stock ownership and the primary drawback is the volatility of stock returns. I mean, I've already shown you the annual returns on the S&P 500 index. The S&P 500 has lower volatility than 
most stocks in the S&P 500 index, if that gives you some indication of the overall volatility. Even our best return prediction models for a single stock are abysmal over short time periods. Remember, this is a part of the reason why we want to diversify our portfolio and hold a diverse array of securities. Diversification will decrease the volatility of our overall portfolio. Now, the other big drawback of stock ownership is that stocks distribute less current income compared to other investment alternatives. If you're a pensioner and you live off your income from your portfolio, it would be foolish to invest most of your portfolio in U.S. stocks, since most U.S. stocks don't pay a dividend. All right, let's try a CFA question. So in this question, it's asking common shares do not entitle investors to what? Well, as you hopefully should remember from Finance 300, and I, I'm sure I've mentioned in this class, we do know that the common stock of a company does entitle you as an investor to a share of the company's operating performance. So if the firm decides to pay out a dividend, then you as a shareholder will likely receive a dividend. Next, as you just saw when I went through the DEF 14A, you do have the right to make decisions in the form of voting at the annual shareholder meeting. So A and B are not the correct answers here. C here is actually the correct answer. Owning shares of a stock does not entitle you to dividend payments in the U.S. So you as a shareholder, yes, you may own shares, but you're not guaranteed to receive a dividend. This is why you don't want to be a pensioner or retiree solely depending on your stock portfolio to generate income for you. So answer C. All right, let's try one more question before we move on. Which of the following decisions is least likely to be the one which common stockholders can vote on? Well, if you remember what I just went over in the DEF 14A discussion, I did show you that we do get to vote on who the company's auditor is. Uh, one other thing that you do get to vote on with respect to your shares is in the case of mergers, let's say your, your company is being acquired. You own shares of a stock and you your company has received a bid from a larger company that wants to acquire your company. Generally, the board will vote, and then in a lot of cases, they'll let the shareholders vote. And if the shareholders reach either a majority or a supermajority, depending on the firm, that firm will agree to be bought out. So in this case, answers A and C are not the right answers here. In this case, answer B is the correct answer. So common stockholders are the least likely to have some say in the dividend payment decision versus the auditor and the merger decision. Uh, they get dividends after everyone else, after the preferred shareholders are paid, and usually the, the board of directors and the management are going to determine whether or not a dividend is paid out. So we'll talk about that later on, but you should know that these other two are common items that get voted on. Now, it's time for me to run through a large number of definitions. I've already used some of these definitions in class, but since we're starting to dive into stock analysis, it's important for me to just refresh some of these definitions and then also give you some new ones. So this arguably is the most definitional I'll get since the first chapter of the course, so I do apologize about that, but let's go ahead and get rolling. The first set of definitions I have to refer to refer to the total market cap of stocks. Large cap stocks, like those of the S&P 500, are typically stocks with a market cap greater than $10 billion. This represents an overwhelming majority of the total market cap in the United States. It accounts for about eh, between 75% and 85% of the total market value of U.S. equities right now. Next, we have mid-cap stocks, and these are stocks of firms with market caps between about $2 billion and $10 billion. Mid-caps are seen at, by investors as having more room for capital appreciation than large-cap stocks. Uh, because they're less diversified than large-caps, they typically also have higher return volatility as well. And finally, we have small-cap stocks. 
These are the stocks of companies with market caps of less than $2 billion. Historically, small caps have outperformed large cap stocks in terms of returns, hence the size anomaly that I mentioned in the last section. The problem with small caps is that they're less liquid and they have more return volatility than either large caps or mid cap stocks. Next, we have speculative stocks. These are stocks that offer potential for substantial price appreciation, but have a poor track record. In 2019, Zoom Communications could have been considered a speculative stock. If it paid off, it was going to pay off big. Drug companies that currently have one product in development that could lead to billions in sales, but not a lot of other sales outside of that product, are often considered speculative stocks or speculative investments. An example of this is Moderna Therapeutics, which in mid-2020 was developing a potential vaccine for COVID-19. Any news of promising developments in that vaccine could lead to a one-day return of, well, 5 to 10 percent. Tech stocks are simply stocks in the tech sector. Most of the stocks on the NASDAQ have at least some operations in the tech sector. Tech stocks include firms that, provide, that produce computers, semiconductors, data storage devices, software internet services, and wireless communications. We all know the big players in the tech industry, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. These firms are referred to as the FANG stocks. It's an acronym. Historically, these and other tech stocks have offered high returns, but they also come with very high return volatility. Next, we need to discuss cyclical and defensive stocks. Cyclical stocks are stocks that perform well in bull markets. Their earnings are positively correlated with the health of the overall economy. During expansionary periods of the business cycle, these firms perform very well. During contractionary periods or recessions, they're the stocks that are most likely to default on their debt obligations. These stocks include airlines and home builders like Lennar and MI Homes. Cyclical stocks also include producers of durable equipment like Caterpillar, since people don't make as many large equipment purchases during contractionary periods of the business cycle. Cyclical stocks historically have very high betas. The alternative to cyclical stocks are defensive stocks. Defensive stocks are stocks that tend to hold their value and even do well when the economy starts to falter. These are stocks that have low betas and sell products that people still need during a recession. Discount grocery stores like Walmart and Kroger often thrive during contractionary periods and are historically viewed as defensive stocks. Producers of non-durable home goods like WD-40 are also viewed as defensive stocks. So the big takeaway here is that cyclical stocks outperform defensive stocks during bull markets, and defensive stocks outperform cyclical stocks during bear markets. Cyclical stocks have high betas, whereas defensive stocks have low betas. Next, we have blue chip stocks. Blue chip stocks are stocks of large, well-established firms with long track records of earning profits and paying dividends. The stocks on the Dow Jones Industrial Average are, are almost universally considered blue chip stocks. Really, any leader in its industry that's profitable and has name recognition is considered a blue chip stock. Examples of blue chip stocks include Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Apple, Google, etc. We also have income stocks. Income stocks are sometimes referred to as dividend stocks since they pay higher than average dividends. These stocks are ideal for investors seeking relatively high levels of current income. Those dividends are often very consistent and slightly increased through time. Most older profitable firms would be considered income stocks. Utilities firms like American Electric Power and Duke Energy are regularly profitable and have very low volatility in earnings, and that means they can sustain a constant dividend. Apple is highly profitable and pays a dividend as well. Many income stocks could also be considered blue chip stocks since they're leaders in their industry. An example of this is Altria, which produces cigarettes. 
The firm is the largest cigarette manufacturer in the U.S., and you might also know it as the former company Philip Morris. After the lawsuits against the firm in the 1990s due to cigarettes causing cancer, the firm rebranded itself Altria and eventually spun off its international operations into Philip Morris International in 2008. Before I describe the next two types of stocks to you, I need to refresh your memory of book and market value. Book value is the price per share of a firm's shareholders' equity on the balance sheet. It's just assets minus liabilities divided by the number of shares outstanding. The book value of equity is often seen as a backward-looking estimate of the value of the firm's shares because it reflects the past performance of the firm. For a forward-looking measure of firm value, we need to look at market value. Market value is the current price per share of a firm's stock on an exchange or the price when the firm's stock was last traded. This price represents what investors are willing to pay for the stock based on their expectations of future cash flows discounted to the present. Historically, the market price per share has been greater than the book price per share of a stock with very few exceptions. In fact, the average market to book ratio has historically been between 1.5 and 2.5. Now, as financial professionals, we focus on the market price per share far more than we will on the book price per share. This is because we're often more concerned about the actual amount a stock is worth rather than the accounting fiction that is the book value. This is obviously where finance differs from accounting. Yes, as financial professionals, we use the book value in many ratios and in analysis. However, we care what securities could be bought and sold for right now far more than we care about what the accounting rules say the stockholders' equity should be. The next two definitions I have for you are value and growth stocks. Value stocks are stocks that have high book-to-market equity, or a high book-to-market ratio. Remember, that's just the price per share of the firm's equity on its balance sheet, divided by the price per share of the firm's stock on the market. We call these stocks value stocks because they're seen to offer high value to investors. They're seen as having depressed share prices as well. There are many investors, called value investors, that target these stocks because of the depressed market price relative to the book price. If you remember my discussion of anomalies in the last section of videos, I mentioned the book-to-market anomaly, or the value anomaly. That anomaly refers to the fact that these stocks as a whole have outperformed growth stocks. Growth stocks are stocks issued by companies experiencing rapid growth in revenues and earnings. We define them as stocks with low book-to-market ratios. Many of the tech stocks you're probably familiar with are growth stocks. Netflix, Amazon, and Tesla would all be considered growth stocks. Growth stocks frequently have low cash flow and profit margins and are growing their sales revenue rapidly. They frequently don't pay dividends because they need to reinvest their profit to keep going. Growth stocks are good for investors that are looking for capital gains rather than dividend income. Now, the final two definitions I have for you relate to valuation. The first is intrinsic value. The intrinsic value is the amount that investors believe the stock should be trading for, or we sometimes think of it as what this stock should be worth. Think of it as the fair value. Of all the definitions I've mentioned so far, this is probably the most important for our purposes since it's what we're trying to estimate in valuation work. The intrinsic value is the value of the stock once we calculate the cash flows we as an investor could receive if we held it in the future, discounted to the present. Your book refers to the intrinsic value as the investment value, but in the real world, most investors like Warren Buffett and myself will call this the intrinsic value. And yes, I did just associate myself with Warren Buffett. I recommend disregarding your book's definition here. Now, since the intrinsic value is the underlying true value of a stock or other security, we have a basic trading rule. As an investor, if the market price for a stock is less than the intrinsic price or the intrinsic value, buy the stock. 
Vice versa, if you own a stock and the intrinsic value is less than the market price, you're going to want to sell the stock. This basic trading rule is why we perform valuation and build complicated valuation models, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. The goal is to calculate the intrinsic value and compare it to the market value. Now, the final definition I have for you is the target price. The target price is often quoted by research reports that describe the price the stock should be worth one year from now. The target price is nothing more than the intrinsic value times the quantity of one plus the expected return on that stock. We calculate the expected return on that stock using the CAPM or the capital asset pricing model, which I described in the last section of videos. All right, let's try another CFA level question, uh, level one question. Which of the following statements is most likely correct? A, uh, management can directly influence both the book value and the market value of the company. B, decrease in book value will automatically cause a company's market value to decrease. Or C, a change in the investor's expectations can impact a company's market value. Well, let's start with A. Management can make all kinds of changes to the accounting rules of the firm, or rather they can ask the, the accounting division or the CFO to do that. Uh, so they can potentially influence the book value of the firm's stock. However, if they wanted to influence the market value of the firm's stock, they're going to have to incentivize investors to buy or sell shares of that stock. That's not exactly direct. So in this case, Answer choice A would not be our answer. Answer choice B is also not correct. And the reason it's not correct is because if there's a decrease in the book value of the stock, remember the book value of the stock is sometimes thought of as the historical value of the stock. It's essentially what you have left over after you're adding in uh, accumulated retained earnings. Uh, so the book value is not a good predictor of the market value of the stock. The market value of the stock is just the expected future cash flows of that stock or the what those shareholders will receive discounted to the present. So the book value is not a good predictor of those future cash flows because, well, it can't predict future cash flows. It only indicates the past cash flows or rather the, uh, the past retained earnings. Finally, we have C. And C here is the correct answer. A change in investors' expectations can impact a company's market value. The reason C is true is because if investors' expectations of a future, of a stock's future cash flows change, Let's say they, they increase. Investors believe that Zoom Communications Company will be far more profitable in the future because every university is using Zoom. Uh, in that case, they're going to buy up shares of that stock, and that, that increased demand for the stock will push the price higher. So answer choice A, or sorry, answer choice C here is the correct answer. All right, let's go ahead and recap. So we talked about many different definitions of stocks. We talked about value stocks, growth stocks, blue chip stocks, tech stocks, and I tried to define all of those. So those are really just definitions you should know going forward. Next, we talked about cyclical stocks outperforming defensive stocks during bull markets. And we also talked about the fact that defensive stocks outperform cyclical stocks during bear markets or contractionary periods. Next, I mentioned that we, as investors or financial professionals, we tend to focus a lot more on the market price per share versus the book price per share. If you're an accounting student, yes, you're going to focus a lot more on book price per share, but for investment professionals, we want to know what people are paying right now for that stock. What is the, the current going rate for shares of that stock? Next. I introduced the idea of the intrinsic value. Now, the intrinsic value is just that fair value of the stock. It's the value that when we do valuation work, it's what we're trying to calculate. It's just the firm or the securities underlying cash flows or future cash flows discounted to the present at some discount rate. Finally, I mentioned the very hard trading rule we have, and that is that we compare the market value of a stock 
to the intrinsic value of a stock to determine whether we want to buy or sell that stock. And that's true of all assets, really. But if our market value is less than the intrinsic value, that would be a case where we want to buy shares of that stock because the, the true value, the intrinsic value, is greater than the market value. Over time, those two should move closer to one another and the price should appreciate to the intrinsic value. That's why you want to buy those shares. So with that, I'm going to end this video and I will see you on the next one. Thank you.